Namaskar. Good evening and welcome to another Double Vision discussion get together. So called, uh, so called Double Vision because we hope that after hearing at least two views on tonight's topic, you might see things from a slightly more well rounded perspective. So whether you're joining us on, uh, on the live Zoom discussion or catching up later on YouTube, we're very glad you can join us and uh, I hope you're having a good day. Mine has been a little odd, if I'm honest. I was in town earlier, crossing the old bridge in Ponty when I saw a man standing on the edge about to jump. I ran over and said, don't do it. Why shouldn't I, he asked. Well, there's so much to live for, I said. Like what? Are you religious, I asked. He said, yes. I said, me too. Are you Christian or, or Buddhist? Christian, he answered. I said, me too. Are you Catholic or Protestant? Protestant, he answered. Me too. Are you Episcopalian or Baptist? He said, Baptist. Wow. Me too. Are you Baptist Church of God or Baptist Church of the Lord? Baptist Church of God. Me too. Are you original Baptist Church of God or are you Reformed Baptist Church of God? Reformed Baptist Church of God. Me too. So I asked him, are you Reformed Baptist Church of God Reformation of 1879 or Reformed Baptist Church of God Reformation of 1915? He said, Reformed Baptist Church of God Reformation of 1915. So I said, die heretic scum and pushed him off. Thank you very much. <laughs> Uh, I, I can't promise that that will be the last of my jokes, but that joke was uh, elected the best religious joke by the irreverent Christian website, Ship of Fools. And as a joke, I think it perfectly encapsulates some of the issues uh, when it comes to religion, humor, and questions of free speech, questions which we'll be dealing with tonight. First, the humor itself. Contrary to the image and reality, we have to say, of many parts of the church, uh, especially today, laughter in the church has long been a tradition. For many years, the fourth Sunday in Lent was known as Refreshment or Laughter Sunday, and it was a day in which uh, the Lenten seriousness was relaxed and churchgoers were encouraged to share holy jokes and tell funny tales. Whilst in 15th century Bavaria, churches used to celebrate the Sunday after Easter as the holy uh, laugh, the Easter laugh or God's joke, as they played practical jokes on one another. And many theologians would say the seeds of humor in the Bible, that parts of the Hebrew Testament and much of Jesus' teaching should be seen through the lens of rabbinic hyperbole and humor. And from a CC to Tutu, many of the great saints of the church displayed a great sense of humor. My favorite line of Desmond Tutu's, of his more comic, comic varieties, when he gave advice for anyone wanting to win a Nobel Peace Prize like him, when he said, to win it, you must have an easy name, a big nose, and sexy legs. So uh, I think uh, I'm not boasting too much when I say I'm still in with a chance. However, just as the ship of fools joke suggests, religious humor has often gone hand in hand with cries of heresy through the years. From some disgust at the aforementioned laughter Sunday to the infamous holy hullabaloo over the life of Brian some 40 years ago, accusations of insensitivity, heresy, even blasphemy have never strayed far from humor that pokes fun at or with religious communities. And whilst much of the debate about humor, its intent, limits and uses has taken place in the academic arena, every so often it's very real and horrific consequences in the world beyond can be seen. We saw that just last year when French teacher Samuel Patty had his head cut off for sharing the, the Charlie Hebdo images of the Prophet Muhammad in a class he taught about freedom of expression. So where does all of this leave us? Are there limits to what we can joke about? Is humor itself a gift from God? And what would God's favorite knock-knock joke be if so? Well, tonight we get the chance to ask and discuss all these questions guided by our two acclaimed guest speakers that will share their perspectives and provoke our thinking. First up, I uh, well, he'll be speaking in a minute, is uh, comedian Sean Owens. Sean is a bilingual comedian, best known for his work with BBC Sesh, the online comedy platform of the BBC. Originally from Carnarvon, Sean now lives in Cardiff, and when not making people laugh, he's mending them, as his day job is a medical engineer designing orthopedic limbs. Uh, he's yet to have made a funny bone yet, though. That joke, copyright of Bethan Walkling. Contact her if you want to complain. Not only is Sean famous for his comedy in Wales, but he has been a part of many Welsh language bands, winning numerous Sella, is that Sella, is that right? Awards, which is the Welsh language equivalent of the Grammy, no less, including best song for three years running, as well as the best band three times. So we are in the company 
of greatness tonight. Sean, it is great to have you along and we are looking forward to what you're going to bring us tonight. Oh, thank you very much, Phil. Um, I, was say, I see you unmuted yourself, so yeah, please. Uh, just in time. Um, yeah. All right, let me... I'll, 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 I'll come back to you if I may. I'll, I'll introduce Andrea. So of you course. Can... Sorry. I thought it was my time to shine. Apologies. Yeah, no. <laughs> well, always. Um, <laughs> after we've heard from Sean, uh, who's keen to, to show us uh, his presentation, he has a PowerPoint presentation and all. It's impressive. We will have a guest whose uh, very face proves that God does have a sense of humor. We have a friend of the church, a friend of the church, and the still newly appointed uh, director of mission in the Oxford Diocese, where we worked out the other day, there are more ordained ministers than in the whole of the United Reformed Church. So good luck keeping them in line. It's only the Reverend Dr. Andrea Russell, former solicitor turned lecturer turned Reverend. Andrea has been described as an Anglican uh, Victoria Wood. So if you have your women's weekly at the ready, let's do it. Uh, a reference for the seniors amongst us there. And uh, I can see at least one that got it. Uh, welcome back, Andrea. It's uh, nice to have you along again. And if you wish to say a quick hello, feel free now. Just hello, it's so nice to see you all again. I, I wish this could have been down in Ponty, but it's not, but it's lovely to see you. And can I just say, just add it in, Phil, that when I was a curate, I won the funniest curate award, please. And, and do you want to say who you beat? I beat Kate Botley. I'm not bragging or anything. But yes. Yeah. So we'll hear more about that, I'm sure, in a minute. Uh, but it's not just about what Sean and Andrea have to say. It's about um, uh, what we've all got to, to bring to the discussion. So the way it's going to work tonight, uh, in case you haven't been here before, is each speaker will have 10 or so minutes to give their presentation. Um, and while they are, the, you might come up, there might be questions that, that spring to your mind um, that you'd like to ask them. If so, please write to me in the chat function. I am the one that says, Phil, if you know how the chat function works, uh, do it like that and just write me a question and I will uh, uh, do something with them. I shall collect them all in, collate them, and uh, we'll we'll be asking them later. If you don't understand how the chat function works, feel free to text me or WhatsApp me. Uh, I think most of you have my number. Uh, and if you're still desperate and, and can't get a question to me, then then write it on a big piece of paper and hold it up to the screen. Um, so we'll have guest speakers. Then we'll have about 20 or so minutes of group chat where um, you'll be put in uh, some smaller groups to, to go through some of the issues that we talked about. Uh, and then we'll come back for questions and answers to the experts. And we'll all be done by uh, nine o'clock. So you won't miss a second of the Real Housewives of Jersey. So a good evening ahead of us all. Um, so for now, I will, uh, I will mute myself because you've certainly had enough of me. And I hand over to Sean, who is going to lead us uh on on the discussion of humor religion free speech and everything in between sean over to you ah th thank you very much phil uh, let me uh share my screen make sure this works right can everyone see my screen just give a nod if you can yes cool all right uh yeah thank you very much for inviting me to do a talk it's nice to feel like i'm doing some sort of performance during during lockdown, I usually do live gigs, but this will do, this will do. So I, I understood that the topic tonight was called holy humor. So, and I've kind of went along the lines of what, what my presentation is like. I, I feel that comedy is what we could be described as the great equalizer, is what makes everyone kind of reach the same level. And I'll, I will explain why I say that as we go on. Um, let me... Is that happening? Cool. Uh, well, Phil's mainly said everything about me already and more. So as he said, I'm a, I'm a stand-up comedian. I perform in both uh, Welsh and English. I've performed in Wales and England as well. Uh, I've, I've been doing it for about four or five years now. And uh, from that, I've been able to become an online content creator for BBC Sesh. Uh, say um, a Wales-based um, comedy branch of the BBC online. And as you said, I'm originally from Carnarvon in, in North Wales, but I'm now based in Cardiff. I'm one of those people who came here for university and I never quite went home. I've, I've just stuck around. 
And I felt it was not important, but I think it's interesting to know that I I was brought up uh, non-religious, so I, I don't have a religion. And I don't even like to be considered an atheist because I don't feel why you have to be something. As, as in, I was never brought up with religion, hence I have no religion. So for me, I, I'm kind of non-biased towards all of them, <laughs> in a way. And uh, I feel I need to uh, do the publicity. I have a podcast <laughs> I did through BBC Sash. It's in Welsh, it's called Vendro Cuntav. Uh, it's available on Spotify and um, BBC Sounds, if you want to have a listen. Um, and yes, that is me with my hair. I shaved my hair two days ago. Uh, you know, lockdown, can't get a haircut. So I, I try to think, like, how do I explain what my sort of point of view is? So I think comedy in general, and specifically for me, it's stand-up comedy or even comedy in the media, is all a form of satire. And what is satire? Well, according to Collins Dictionary, I've referenced it, satire is the use of humor or exaggeration in order to show how foolish or wicked some people's behavior or ideas are. Now, this is basically the foundation of the vast majority of any stand-up material, stand-up comedy material, even observational humor and quite famous observational comedians are people like Michael McIntyre, who he talks about, he's, he's quite non-offensive, he doesn't make fun of anyone, but he makes fun of himself, he makes fun of ourselves, our daily life. He has quite a famous bit about uh, people having spice racks and what the different spices you have there or how you deal with a... Um, when, when a bee comes around, how do you deal with that? That is satire. He makes fun and he points out how foolish the situation or our point of view or thoughts is towards the situation. But then you also have anecdotal humor, which if someone says, oh, I have a funny story. The reason it's funny is usually because it's absurd. Something, something foolish has happened within that story that you then make fun of, of the fact that that happened. Uh, so that's only one type of satire humor, but it's also in the form of art or literature. I mean, a meme is essentially a satire in itself. When you see a, an image and someone superimposes text over it, you make fun of a situation, it's satire. Literature, you have books, uh, media, music, all, all sort of uh, creative output uses satire. And then religious satire, quite straightforward, is satire that refers to religious belief. It's probably existed for as long as religion itself has existed. And as, as Phil pointed out, it's often been criticized uh, to make fun of any form of religious belief. And sometimes it's been censored. I, I was going to say often censored, but that's actually not the case. You only hear about the times that they are censored rather than the hundreds and thousands of times that it's actually let alone, left alone. So I'm, I'm not sure how familiar a lot of you are with the world of stand-up comedy, but I thought, oh, I'll point out a few world-famous comedians and the ones who are quite well-known for um, not making fun of religion, but often including religion within their stand-up stand comedy set. Uh, so you have George Carlin. He's an American comedian. Um, he... He famously often made fun of uh, Christianity. Because um, I think one important note to is, although I said I'm not religious, since I've been born and brought up in Wales, culturally, I am technically Christian. So everything I've been brought up with is Christian culture surrounded by me. And same with George Callan, that was his point of view as well. He's saying, well, if I was born in a different country, I would be brought up with a different religion. It's a culture aspect. So he kind of made fun of many different religions, but mainly Christianity. Uh, and then you got Jim Jeffries, he's an Australian comedian. Um, he's basically done the same, but in a lot more vulgar way. Um, you could argue that he's, he's more offensive than George Carlin is. And he's, he's not to everyone's say, so he's not necessarily my favorite either. Uh, you've got Bill Burr on the right here, he's a, He's a American comedian. He's often joked about how he used to be religious, how he was brought up in a religious household. And then as he stepped away from religion, what, what, what were his observations of the world of religion and religious family and religious norms? Uh, then you've got Stuart Lee. He's a 
a British comedian, quite a well-known and well-respected British comedian, who's, again, quite similar to Bill Burr. He's stepped away from religion throughout his life and gives him a chance to look and observe and kind of, well, satire religion as he went on. Um, there's another example from him later on, so I thought it was born to have in him. And uh, you got Ricky Gervais, he's probably one of the most famous ones for mocking religion. I feel like I need to say I personally don't like Ricky Gervais's humour. I think that he is offensive. I think that what he does is he purposely says things that are mean and that he knows will get a reaction and for some reason that's classified as comedy. Uh, I'm personally not a fan of his, but he is a famous comedian for mocking religion. Um, I felt that since I've only, so far, I've only named five white men comedians who uh, tend to mock Christianity. I felt it was quite important to have Aziz Ansari there as well. He's an American comedian who's a Muslim, and he basically does exactly the same as the other comedians do, but for Islam. And I think it's, it's an important to point out that they all tend to make fun of the religion that forms their culture as opposed to religion that forms other people's culture. And, but none of these have really had any legal issues when it got, comes to um, like making fun of religion, the comedy sets. And I, I thought about it, are there many examples of actually comedians getting in trouble for performing stand-up comedy, mocking religion? And something literally happened last month. There was a comedian in India that was arrested before he even did a set because someone thought that he'd written a joke offending Hindu gods. So he was arrested on the 1st of January, 2021, and he was in jail for 35 days. So as an example that it still happens now, uh, there's still quite a strong form of censorship. Um, I don't think this really happens in the UK or in America maybe, but it shows that it does still happen. <laughs> it's still quite recent news that there's quite a lot of censorship and I'm, I'm not gonna say oppression for comedy uh, pointing towards religion, but it's, uh, 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 is this a freedom of speech issue? I don't know, let's have a discussion about it later. Then as Phil pointed out, I wanted to give some quite famous examples of religious satire in the media. Life of Brian is one of the most famous ones there are. So it received quite intense criticism for blasphemy um, the BBC and ITV, they refused to broadcast it for a number of years in the fear that they'd offend uh, British Christians because they saw it, that it mocked uh, Jesus Christ and it mocked um, his suffering from crucifixion by depicting crucifixion themselves. And in the movie, they say, oh, no, crucifixion is not that bad. Don't worry about it. So they say that hinders uh, the way they view that Jesus sacrificed himself. He went through a lot of pain and torment. And uh, it was banned in Norway and Ireland and also parts of Britain, which was funny that local councils and town councils, they would ban any showing of the movie with none of the town councillors actually seeing the movie themselves. You just heard someone else say, ban a movie, mock Jesus. OK, we will. Yeah, don't worry about it. And it was the ban was only lifted in Aberystwyth in 2009. And... I don't know if you know this, but the mayor of Aberystwyth, I, I don't know if she still is or at the time, was an actress in the movie, The Life of Brian. She's the woman who's uh, Brian's lover, <laughs> ironically. So it, it's, that's one of the famous examples. Um, how do you feel about that? Do you feel it feels justified or do you think that maybe it went a bit over the top? I don't know, let's discuss it later. Um, another one that I don't think is as well known as Life of Brian, but Jerry Springer, the opera. So Stuart Lee, the comedian, the British comedian I named earlier, he wrote this, well, he co-wrote this musical and it received quite intense backlash for, for blasphemy uh, because it featured Jesus, Mary and Adam Eve in the third act of the show where Jesus is, um, he would often be wearing a diaper as opposed to a loincloth as he's wearing there. They would sometimes change it to a diaper and he'd act as a whiny person saying, no, I'm giving my way, giving my way. And then he would argue with Satan and they would swear at each other. And then it received quite, quite a lot of backlash. People were protesting and picketing outside of um, showings of the musical. And in nearly 
of what I understand, uh, please someone correct me if I'm wrong, in Neely brought the first blasphemy case to court in the UK in the 20th century. Um, they, I think Christian Voice, I think is quite a right-wing extremist um, branch of, of it. Uh, they attempted to prosecute the BBC for um, uh, broadcasting the musical, but I think it was, it was thrown out of, the case was thrown out of course before it actually went. But uh, Stuart Lee has often said that when he wrote the show, he thought it was the best thing he's ever done. And then afterwards he said, that's the biggest mistake I've ever done because of the intense um, like physical and mental trauma he gave him from having to deal with all this backlash all the time. And he, he said that he didn't really affect his stand-up work, but he was always afraid to do material about it in case it always came back to him. And then I, I assume you've all heard of the TV show South Park. If not, it's, um, it's been around for years. It's an American show. Um, it's, it's been described as being quite vulgar towards everything, not only religion, but it often targets organized religion. And they have the, oops, sorry, they have the philosophy that all religions can be targeted, not only specific ones. Although the writers are white uh, men brought up similar to me in a Christian culture, they say that, but if we mock Christianity, we also should be allowed to mock Judaism, Mormonism, Islam, and Scientology. So they do. They, they mock all of them equally. And um, they even mock atheists. So the, the picture we have here is when they joke that atheism becomes a church in itself, and then there's wars between atheists and well, what do we call ourselves? So it's, they, they just mock the whole idea of it, really. And they've quite famously added the censorship of uh, religious satire itself. So I, I, I wanted to have this picture because I think it's an interesting case. They had something that they, they kind of created a Avengers team of religious icons. And they had the Prophet Muhammad part of the team. And when they first broadcasted a specific episode, they depicted the Prophet Muhammad. And they didn't have any backlash, they didn't have any issues. Then years later, um, it became a problem to depict the Prophet Muhammad in any form of media. But they were saying, but we did it six years ago. Why is it a problem now? And it, and, and it wasn't back then. What's the issue here? So then they did sh uh, episodes where they would still have the Prophet Muhammad there, but they would purposely put a black, black box over him saying censored, and then they would mock the idea that they always have to be censored, and then it's it's a it's really funny episode. <laughs> I, I do recommend you watch it. It's it's just an interesting point of view for someone that mocks the whole idea of religion rather than specific ones. And because they did that, the creators actually received death threats, saying, since you mock our need, our want to censor Muhammad, we will censor your censorship. It was um it was quite a complex idea, but they've they, they've remained unharmed. And they, they, they firmly have believed that either everything's okay to mock or nothing's okay to mock. And then the same creators have created the Book of Mormon. So I'm good to the Book of Mormon because I saw it uh, a few years ago in London. I it was meant to come to Cardiff in 2020. And I had tickets for it. I was very excited, but obviously it got cancelled. So I'm, I think it's been delayed to... Uh, 2023 or the end of 2022. I think it's 2022. But it uh, quite clearly, quite heavily mocks and parodies a belief on Mormonism or Mormons. And it, um, it often has um, uh, the lead character as being a homosexual, but then he's he's a repressive homosexual because he knows it's, it's not accepted within the church. Uh, they sing about the, the contents of the Book of Mormon, obviously in an exaggerated way, in a comical way. And when they did it, everyone thought, oh, the, the, the Mormon church is going to be angry. But surprisingly, the Mormon church was absolutely okay with it. They had, they, they just said, as long as people know that this is fiction and that it doesn't really represent the book of book, the book, real Book of Mormon, we don't mind. If anything, uh, the, church, the Mormon church actually used this musical as, as publicity for them. So they used to have posters around saying, you've seen the show, now read the book. The book is always better. And uh, apparently it actually in, 
they saw an increased number of people actually taking that um, that that religion because of the Book of Mormon. They they learned about Mormonism, they looked into it and realized, oh, this actually suits me. I'll, I'll look into this. I and the show, the musical is brilliant and it is hilarious. I highly recommend that if you can that you go see it. So the whole idea of me just trying to give you these examples is because I kind of wanted to give you an idea of why I have a certain point of view of the relationship between comedy, satire, and religion. So religion has and always will be material for comedy and satire, no, no, matter, no matter how progressive or something a religion will become. It is still based on a belief and that there will always be space to satire that or not mock, that, that's not the right word. Uh, but to basically is to take the make out of someone, you know, it's um, it always will exist. And I kind of get the idea that everyone likes satire. Everyone likes someone making fun of something that's silly until it impacts them personally. So as a Welsh speaker, I will often make fun of other cultures going, oh, the French do this. Oh, that's ridiculous. Oh, have you seen what the English do there? But then the moment someone makes fun of the Welsh language, I go, that's just not funny. That's just not funny. How dare you? Like, do, do you? this is a personal attack on me but then i do the same to their culture they do it to mine um so who am i to say that what's okay and what's not and then i put freedom of speech in quotation marks because people often quote freedom of speech as an excuse to say oh you can't censor uh, comedy you can't censor what people say but i think freedom of speech is often used as an excuse for people to be mean that they can say things as quite harsh quite cruel or sometimes untrue and then hide under the umbrella of freedom of speech to not have anyone get angry with them to not have any consequence so then he asked the question well where is the line when it comes to satire what's okay and what's not and someone's often said that there's oppressors and there's oppressed if you make fun of the oppressed, you are an oppressor. But if you make fun of the oppressors, you're then sticking it to the man. You're, you're fighting for the oppressed. You kind of bulk up. So it's down to where you see that balance. Where, where, who do you see as the oppressors? And I think for a lot of people, they tend to think that historically, maybe not now, but historically religion has often formed a some form of oppressive nature. Like even with scientific research in the past, they would oppress us saying, no, you're not allowed to look into this because it disproves what we believe or anything like that. So I think that's, again, another source of why people tend to target religion. Uh, but, but in regards to saying, where is the line? I think often people tend to, and they, tend to understand subconsciously where the line is. And an example for this, uh, has anyone here watched Seinfeld? It's like a t TV, an American TV sitcom. It was around the same time as Friends. And one quite famous actor on it uh, was a character called Kramer. And he was very, very famous, very well loved throughout the world, throughout America. And then um, he's been known as one of the first casualties of uh, mobile, mobile phones with cameras where he did a stand-up set and he got angry and he used the N-word a lot of times. He was very, very offensive. He used the N-word again and again and again. And someone filmed it and it went online. His reputation was instantly tarnished because everyone seemed to understand he has crossed the line. There's a line being crossed here. No one really defended that. No one said, well, that's, that's freedom of speech. He's allowed to say that. Everyone tends to just know. So if there's disagreement between if the line's been crossed, or not, I would tend to think, well, maybe not, because I think that some people have just gone and offended by this, but the majority of people haven't, hence, I think it's okay. I think it's just, you've been offended yourself. But one of the questions I think is quite important to think is, is it okay to mock every religion? Can every religion be mocked? Or should none of them be mocked? Either are they all off limits because it's a personal belief that you have and same as what happened in India, uh, there was a law that protects religious belief. Should that then be that no one is ever allowed to make fun of anything or are they all okay? Or is it okay to mock every other religion except yours? You know, 
but um, where do you draw the line? I basically, I just wanted to create that sort of thoughts in your head, that sort of conversation, because that's the end of my PowerPoint. And um, I hope you've enjoyed. I hope I've given some sort of examples. Um, but yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Sean. That's, uh, there's loads of threads there that I'm sure we're going to come back to in the questions. Um, so much about, about, I mean, some of the questions that have come in are, yeah, does, what part does uh, power play or the lack of it on, on, you know, in who it's okay to laugh at or, or to satirize? Um, yeah, well, there's a load of questions coming. We'll come back to, uh, as someone who has um, seen the Book of Mormon twice, uh, I've <laughs> favorite memories of when I was training for ministry is when a secretary of, of one of the churches I was training at kind of sidled up to me and, and uh, he, he liked the theatre and he said, um, I saw, uh, I did see the Book of Mormon. And I thought, oh, oh, okay. And, and what do you think? I thought it was absolutely hilarious. And it was a <laughs> confession. Um, and I know for a fact that the general secretary of the URC, uh, who would be uh, kind of the boss if we had one, uh, is a big fan of the uh, the Book of Mormon. Personally, I think the, the theology of it is fascinating. But anyway, I, it's not about me. Thank you so much, Sean. We will be coming back to you with some um, hard-hitting questions later. Uh, Looking forward to it. Thank you. I uh, Thank you. For now, I hand over to uh, Andrea to, uh, uh, to give her presentation and help us to continue the discussion. Thanks, thanks, Phil. Thanks, Sean. That's a hard act to follow, literally. Um, You've been looking at this idea of, of, of humour and the way that it, the, its relationship with religion, if you like, from the outside. Um, and I want to think about it a little bit from the inside. Um, so I don't know what you've missed a lot in COVID, anyone, but, but one of the things I've really missed is just meeting up with people and having a really good laugh. Um, I realise just how much I enjoy those sort of moments where you just, you know, you, you're giggling or something's really chuckled you. Actually, funnily enough, Phil, we did have a laugh the other week when I couldn't hear a word you were saying. And for some reason, it made me giggle quite a lot. Um, and it just made me realise afterwards just, just how much better you feel in yourself when you laugh. Um, I mean, to that point where, you know, you're aching and you don't know what to do and all that sort of thing. And I say that because it seems to me that, that, that laughing is a real, really important part of being a human being. Um, and this idea of humour, um, so um, of being able to, to tell jokes, of being able to, to find things funny in ourselves and in other people and in, in situations, uh, seems to me to be a really important part of, of what it means to be human together. Uh, so many years ago, I did a, a sermon on humour and apparently, and at that point, Sean, sure, I don't know if this is still the case, um, one of the funniest moments that was taken from TV was the bit in Only Fools and Horses where Del Boy falls through the, um, the bar. I don't know if anybody's seen it, you can look it up. And apparently it's all to do with timing and things. And what really intrigued me about that was that every time I saw it, even though I knew what was going to happen, it had me absolutely in stitches. Now, it's not everybody's cup of tea. And that's the other bit, isn't it? My sense of humour is not necessarily your sense of humour. And how do we do that? And those of us who preach regularly, looking at you, Ray, know that you use humour in the pulpit at your peril often because what you might think is funny um, can, can just set everything off to the wrong way. So I want to say that bit about the fact that I think that humour is a really important part of being human. And therefore, if it's a really important part of being human, and I believe that Christianity is our call to be fully human, then something about humour should be a part of who we are together. Now, in some ways, Phil nicked part of what I wanted to say, which he often does in his, his intro. Um, but I want to say that, that I think if you talk to people about Christianity and humour, I, I don't think that us as a smiling, laughing, joke-telling people is the first thing that often comes to mind. I mean, Sean, forgive me, you're my only outsider here, but, but I'm guessing that, that, you know, say the word Christian, you don't suddenly think barrel of laughs. Can I just say, he knows Bethan, so... It, the he does think it's about a laugh. Okay, I withdraw it all. Um, 
so it makes me sort of interested to then, um, well, two things. One is to look at scripture and say that when we look at the, the Bible stories about Jesus, it's interesting that it, the Bible tells us that Jesus slept, that he walked, that he ate, uh, he drank a lot of wine um, and he wept. But not once does it say Jesus laughed. And that's always intrigued me. So hold that. Um, and I did some work a little while ago on the role of humour in reconciliation. The role that humour plays when we're trying to, to, um, to bring sides together. So my Beth is on this call, so I'm hoping that she's not going to get really cross with me. So but when Bethany was a very little girl, um, I don't know if you're supposed to do this now, but we had a naughty step. And, um, and oh, hello, Beth. And um, so uh, if they'd been naughty, I would ask them to sit on the bottom step and think about what they'd done for a little while, while I then went away, probably seething and came back. Anyway, one day I found Bethany sitting on the bottom step and I said to her, sweetheart, well, what are you doing there? She'd be about three. And she said, I've been naughty and I thought it was faster. Um, so she put herself there. Um, and I have to say that I couldn't tell her off because I was absolutely crying with laughter. I thought this was hysterical. We eventually found out what she'd done, which was probably very naughty because she used to do some very naughty things. Um, but a, a different space had been created. And I don't know if you know the stories of Mo Mola and, and her work in Northern Ireland. I mean, if we're thinking about places that are broken, you can't imagine that the Northern Ireland peace talks have got anything much to do with with humour. But there's a, a famous story of Mo Molum sitting around the table with both sides. And I don't know if you remember that Mo Molum had um, a brain tumour and she'd had chemotherapy and she'd lost all her hair. So she was she was wearing a wig. And the story is that that the you know the the tension in the room was palpable. Um, and if we're talking about the role of religion in some of this as well. Um, and she started the meeting off by taking her wig off and putting it on the table in the middle and said, I need to take this bloody thing off. I've been wanting to scratch my head the whole time and it's really whatever. And the whole room just, it's just so we know we've got it, we've got another person around the table with us. And the whole room erupted. And, and apparently the, the discussion went differently. Now, it didn't all get fabulously done, but I began to do some work on, on, on humor creating a safe third space for us. And that made me think about the fact that, that the Bible, for me, um, I think, is, is about God wanting us to, to be back in full relationship with God, whatever that might mean to us. And therefore, if that's the case, and humour, I think, is a part of that, I began to look at scripture to work out how and when and the possibilities of where humour might have been used in order to create a safe third space where we can all meet. So rather than being God over here and me over here and God shouting at me about how rubbish I am, um, or me shouting at God about how rubbish God is, that somehow there's a different space. Now, it seems to me that you don't, you don't have to look too far if you, if for the Book of Jonah. The Book of Jonah, I'm sorry, Sean, the Book of Jonah does make me laugh. You might want to have a read. It's a story about a man who God says, please go to these people and tell them I love them and I really want to do lovely things for them. And Jonah says, no, I'm not going because I don't like those people and I don't want you to like them either. So he goes the other way um, and basically ends up in a whale. I mean, that's the way of it. If you, you know, if you end up not doing what God asks you to do, you end up in a whale. I mean, I think that could be a good story. Um, but what about the stories that Jesus tells? How many of those can have humour? And I think Phil alluded to that, and I noticed Ray nodding at the beginning. I began to look at some of the stories and wonder whether uh, there is a famous picture of Jesus laughing, and we can't use it, I don't think, because of copyright, but you might want to lock it up. What if I imagined Jesus laughing and smiling when he delivers some of his stories? What, what effect does that have? And I have my two favourites. One is the parable of the sower. So in the parable of the sower, if you remember, Jesus tells the story of the farmer who basically chucks 
seed willy-nilly all over the place. And there's a very serious side to this because the seed is supposed to be faith and what we do with it and you know does it does it land where it lands how much does it grow and so forth but there's a, an idea actually that that the people who were listening to him wouldn't have really got much further than the first line because the idea that anybody would chuck seed here there and everywhere that was incredibly precious that they'd spent all their money on they immediately think that this is the you know the the, the idea of a joke so this idea of a farmer throwing everything. The second one that I played with, and I, I did this at a conference of a lot of Anglican clergy. Now, if you're ever looking for places where humour could be needed, this is one. Uh, so there were about 300 Anglican clergy, and I gave them a different idea of the, uh, of the, the passage where Jesus talks about an eye for an eye bit. I'm not convinced they were very thrilled with it, but I'm going to share it with you on the basis that you love me more than them. And, and the idea is that Jesus says, um, um, you know, if your eye offends you, gouge it out. If your, if your hand offends you, cut it off. This idea is that, that um, somehow sin is very serious. And, and if, we, um, if we're to take that seriously, then he, he brings this really serious image. And the whole story ends with Jesus saying, be perfect as your father in heaven is perfect. Now, that's pretty heavy stuff. But then I began to wonder if Jesus might have been a bit of a stand-up comedian. So imagine Sean Owens with more of a beard and Jesus sandals and him giving this thing of trying to, to get us to realise something about the seriousness of what we do with our lives. But saying, you know, if, you're, if your eye offends you, you gouge it out. And so he, he's got one hand over his eye and then he's got one hand up his back and then he's trying to balance on one leg and basically falling into all the children um, and ends up on the floor in a heap and then declares those words, be perfect as your father in heaven is perfect, as he is being clambered over by children who think this is the funniest thing ever. What, what different vision might that be? Now, who knows? Um, you know, I may well be wrong. Um, but I, I think I want to leave you with a couple of questions when you go into the workshop is, the vision of a laughing Jesus, how does that change or shape the way that you think about God? And the vision of a, of a laughing Jesus, how does that change and shape the way that you think God looks at you? Um, yeah, they're my two. Um, and I haven't got a joke to finish with. I'm really sorry. I'm not that good at delivering jokes. Um, and, and I'm going to end. Thank you. Thank you very much, Andrea. Many of your sermons have made me laugh um, for different reasons. So uh, I think you're... Well, you nick them, so you can't be that well. Actually, you nick them and then rewrite them. Yeah, exactly. Shush. Um... <laughs> So many uh, uh, threads there as well that we'll, we will come back to, which is great. I don't know about uh, the rest of you, but when Andrew was talking about the, the cut your eye out, gouge your eye out, cut your arm off, I was thinking tis but a flesh wound um, and the humour in that. Um, anyway, uh, we have had our two wonderful guest speakers and we'll ask them some more questions later. Some of the questions have come in, others uh, I'm sure will do. For now, it's your time to have uh, a discussion of some questions. So. Um, by magic, the questions are going to appear on the screen, and I'm going to put them in group chat as well. So Andrew has given you a couple. Uh, here are a few more. Now, you only have about 20 minutes, so you probably only have time for one of these, but you might want to think, you might want to choose just one. So the questions are, have you ever been offended by a religious-themed program, play, song, or joke? If so, uh, what was it, and what offended you about it? Um, and if not, do you think there are limits to comedy? This kind of relates, you know, maybe uh, Life of Brian. Maybe you think they do, they will get their, their 30 pieces of silver, as, as the bishop of somewhere said to them um, when it first came out. Um, or you might have seen Jerry Springer, the opera, or you might have seen other things. And so in which case, have a chat about that and what does offend. Question two, uh, a quote by John Cleese. And again, this refers kind of to, to Sean's The Great Equalizer. Uh, John Cleese says, I'm struck by how laughter connects you with people, something that Andrew brought up. It's almost impossible to maintain any kind of distance or any sense of social hierarchy when you're just howling with laughter. Laughter is a force for democracy. 
So very much that Mo Molum story. Do you agree that laughter is a source of good in the world? Three, um, more suffering comes into the world by people taking offense than people intending to give offense. I think that's a fascinating um, outlook. And uh, so you're, you're invited to, to discuss that and consider how much should we consider the intention and the target of the humor in our response to it. Uh, Frankie Boyle and, and Ricky Gervais, two controversial comedians in their own right, have very, very different attitudes to this. Um, and there's a very interesting argument there about, about what's in the intention and who is the target. And finally, Martin Luther King Jr. I mean, we can't go wrong with him. It is cheerful to God when you rejoice or laugh from the bottom of your heart. Again, looks at some of the things that Andrew brought up. How might we spend more time or laughing in our churches? How might we spread more laughter in our living? You're going to have uh, a minute before you're going to be put into groups. So you introverts, uh, can you, you can have just a minute to have a think of these because we're short on time tonight. Um, and then you'll be put in your groups and then you'll be brought back just about 25 to just after. Um, so you don't have long, but you can start to uh, hammer out these. The questions will be put in the chat as well in case uh, you, you know you, you won't have got all those down. So I'll be quiet. Uh, and you'll have, we have a minute of quiet uh, and then you'll be put in your groups. So you have some time to think and we'll see you on the other side. For Andrea. Um, Andrea, one question we had was, could humour be used as a safe uh, third space between religions? What, what issues might this bring up? I think that's a really, really interesting question to which I have no answer. Um, I mean, I want to say that if the if the theory works, then yes, it should. Um, but you'd, I mean, I, mean I, I keep thinking back to Mo Molum and, and taking that incredible, incredibly brave step. I mean, the other person to think about is Desmond Tutu um, and the way that he used religion, uh, used humour and reconciliation. But you, between religions, that, that's an interesting one, isn't it? And it, I mean, I think the problem might be that it, it would it would be what you were what what you were making fun of. It would be so I, I you know I don't think it would be good that you made fun of the you know the other religion um, or even possibly well possibly your own. Um, yes, I think it could is the answer. I don't see why not, but I think you'd you'd need to tread carefully. You, yeah. I think it touches upon many issues of 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 who is holding the power as uh, we, well, that's the other question one of the questions got isn't it yeah. so you know the, there is there is oh we probably have not got time you know the joke about who's in heaven yes which we might do later but again it's that idea of if you were going to use it you'd probably have to make the humor about yourself i think at, at that point and and this the next question that was directed uh to sean will might open up because there was a few questions about power and what role does power or the lack of it play. Um, but one particular question that kind of relates to that to Sean was, uh, would you describe your comedy on BBC Sesh as quite tame? And if so, is this about uh, not being willing, not wanting to offend or reaching a wider audience? So Sean. So I thought that was an interesting question, especially when you talk about uh, the balance of power, who has the power. And the vast majority of my BBC Sesh videos tend to be about the fact that I'm Welsh, that I'm a Welsh speaker, and how we as a community or a culture are treated by our, uh, our English-speaking neighbours or the um, English-speaking Welsh. So, um, like, uh, I've, I've been told off by my producers quite, quite a lot where I'd write a script, I'd send it to them, and they would say, Sean, this is quite anti-English. But then I would argue, say, no, no, it's not, it's just pro-Welsh. Like, um, I, I fully disagree. Uh, but I, uh, one of them that actually caused a bit of a back and forth between us is I did one about a call centre where I pretended to be a call centre operator, but based in Wales. So uh, English people would call in and I would mispronounce their names. I would say that, uh, oh, do you, uh, are you called Annabelle Smith? And then it's, oh, Annabelle, sorry, it's just not, that's not how it's spelt. And then I would um, make fun, oh, there's, um, there's too many consonants or there's not enough vowels, you know, try to reverse the sort of language for them because we get mocked for that quite often. And it's just a rebalance of 
empowered in a way that we mock them, we mock them for mocking us, <laughs> kind of thing, really. But uh, I, I wouldn't say they're tame. <laughs> I try to, um, I try to point out some sort of inequalities, but I, I never do it about a marginalized group or anything. I, I would never do it about any sort of race. Or any, I tend to never talk about religion or anything anyway. But also it's because it's a platform for Welsh comedy that tends to be my topic. And I try to make the vast majority of them at least bilingual, contains a little bit of Welsh in all of them. So again, this, going back to the power, and this goes to, to both of you, um, but perhaps as your, your unmuted Sean, we'll go for you first. Is, do you think, are there different um, ethical considerations involved when you're laughing at someone, a group that has power to you're laughing at or with a group that doesn't? And, and one example that someone asked is, you know, when it comes to Welsh and English and who has the power there, but also when it comes to uh, laughing at Christianity and, and laughing at Islam and, and questions of certainly in the UK, who has the power and who is more vulnerable. So do we... Do, can we have different standards of of who it's okay to laugh at when it comes to the the power we we think they um hold well yeah clearly you do because even without nina to ask you you tend to know that if you were going to mock any religion would you rather prefer christianity or islam which one do you think would offend most you'd probably say well i'll i'll, I'll mock christianity um there's probably some it's probably quite a complex question to why that is um I think there's racial um, issues there as well. Um, and I do think that Christianity is, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, the most popular religion in the world still. Am I, am I right in saying that? Is it 30 something percent? It depends how you define, yeah, who's Christian and, and different strands and stuff. But yeah, yeah, it still it has all, a lot of power. <laughs> yeah, so it's still top of the food chain. So it's still fair game. <laughs> you could argue in that way. Um, but also it's what you have to think of what sort of oppression has those groups actually um, suffered so Judaism they've quite clearly uh, suffered quite a lot of things so you tend to be quite sensitive if you were ever to mock them and same with Islam you kind of feel like you just need to be careful because there's more to it that culturally I know I don't know anything about Islam who am I to mock them I don't know anything about their way of life so if I were to mock, it would probably end up being um, ignorant and offensive. Whereas, as I said earlier, culturally, I've been brought up Christian, although I'm not Christian. So you tend to know that if, you, if you're mocking something, that it's, it's safe. You, you, you know a little bit about what you're talking about. Andrea, what do you think? What's the, what, what role does context and, and power? And I think it's a lot. I mean, obviously, I'm an Anglican, and, and a, a lot of, I spend a lot of time in church circles where... Um, well, we are the, you know, you meant you made the comment, you know, initially that there's more. I'm director of ministry. I've got more ministers under my oversight than than there is in the URC as a whole, um, and that seems to me to be a really important part of what I do. So I work when I work ecumenically. It's really important that the person that I make fun of is me. Um, that the that you know the Church of England holds huge amounts of power and has in the past and you know we we haven't always wielded that in a way that's been very gracious towards our ecumenical partners um so I, i'm you know slight pain in the bomb internally but i'm but i'm also aware externally when i'm working that if there's any jokes to be made then that has to be made at my expense mm. even if i'm finding my urc partners funny or the Methodist hysterical, or whatever it might be, that I, I need to tread carefully because, because I just have more power generally than they do often in those circles. There's, there's some of you will be aware of the, of the show, and you know there's a special spelling, so this is okay for me to say uh, Shit's Creek, uh, that won several. Um, just started watching it. Excellent show. I, I personally love it. And and the writers um, when they when they started writing it, they said we always wanted the joke to be at the family who are very rich, um, certainly at the start, and privileged, that the joke should be on them and not at the, the, the small town Americans who you know, could otherwise be shown to be stupid or whatever else. So again, it's, it's, 
it's kind of taken the, the idea of you can mock the powerful, you can mock the establishment, but don't mock, you know, those those who are oppressed, which might go refer back to some of the things we were saying about Jesus and his uh, his mocking of religious institutions. And it would indeed go to to, to other things we brought up about like Life of Brian, when um, uh, they weren't really mocking Jesus. In fact, they, Jesus makes an appearance in, in the film and they don't mock Jesus, they mock the organised religion and... Uh, yeah, that kind of thing. Anyway, we've got so many other questions. Uh, so I'll race through them. Um, one to Sean. Were you nervous talking to us about a religion and humour tonight? And if you were, well, look at these lovely friendly faces around here. Not, don't look at that one in the corner. Um, if, you, if you were, uh, why, why might that be? And if you weren't, why, why might that be? Um... Uh, the, the real answer is um, no, I wasn't nervous talking about religion with you, but maybe I was a little bit nervous about talking about mocking of religion with you. But I wasn't actually that nervous, Phil, because you actually sent a very nice email describing what sort of people you were and what sort of atmosphere this was. So I thought, ah, I'll be fine. As, as long as I don't you swear. You just lie too much. a lot, Sean. <laughs> <laughs> the congregation are listening, Andrea. That's not helpful. <laughs> Not on a Sunday. Yeah. As long as I don't swear too much, I bet it would be fine. But I don't know. I, I think maybe I was a little bit because, as I said at the beginning, it was like I'm I'm not religious, so I was always a bit worried that maybe I would say something that would sound incredibly ignorant, where I would think, well, surely this is what everyone knows, and then you go, no, this is actually quite offensive to us. So I was a little bit careful about that, but no, I I wasn't really nervous because I I, I would like to know what everyone's um, feeling is towards uh, mocking of Christianity because the majority of things I see mocks Christianity as opposed to other religions mainly because as I've said that's mainly what I see um, but now nah, you've, you've all been okay but everyone's been muted they might be swearing at me no, and, this, uh, behind the microphones just this like is one of the it. joys and problems of, of this format and we have discussed more about uh, further about having a an extended session where we can hear more of the group discussions. Uh, rather yeah, I, I might get hate mail after this. <laughs> People say, I never liked you. Yeah, um, I've got Sean's email address. So if anyone <laughs> wants to, let, me, let me know. Um, Andrea, who is your favorite comedian? And then Sean, in a sec, I'll come to you for your favorite theologian. No, uh, comedian. <laughs> Andrea. Um, um, I think, well, two, two, I think, really. I mean, I do like Miranda. Um, I think because Beth and I watch it together and um, she makes me laugh. And and I think I probably quite like some of the slightly slapstick things about it, which I was surprised about myself. And because it's set in just, you know, a vaguely ordinary life. Um, and all those embarrassing things that happen to you that she then, you know, she um, magnifies, I suppose. Um, but the person I've often used, well, yeah, I've got a couple. So I do, I do quite, I like Victoria Wood because I like her time in. Um, and I like the way that, you know, she, she, again, she talks about lots of women's issues that um, I went to one. Actually, interestingly, my only time of going to see Victoria Wood was on the day of the 9-11 oh, wow. um, attacks. And, um, and I, yeah how she handled that was really interesting but she talks about women's issues that that basically i think all the men in the audience would not have well they were just dying of sheer embarrassment we were crying um with laughter and i do like peter k because he's really working class that, that's my background i've tried not to get distracted by um a couple of our our zoom people um in one particular household having their own little comedy gig apparently uh yeah turn bethan so uh Eyes, eyes on the screen. Um, there's a very, uh, Billy Connolly has a very interesting um, discussion about, uh, he did a, a, a gig um, on 9-11 and, and, you know, talks about the need, going back to, to, to what Andrew was saying about, about laughter being very, being human. And if, if Christianity or, you know, the, the gospel is about being in life in all its fullness, what is it, you know, being fully human and going back to what Sean said about the great equalizer. And uh, he, he discusses how, you know, it, there was a great need on that day to laugh. Apparently, Sting was was in this was in New York as well, and 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 was questioning cancelling the con a concert. But um, you know, Billy Connolly was saying there's this need for us to get together and be human, and what's more human, uh, and to laugh together. Um, Sean, 
uh, Phil, out, out of interest, do you listen to the Adam Buxton podcast? I do, yes. I, I do. I've, I've heard the same story of Billy Connolly. Um, yeah. My favourite comedian changes all the time, uh, to be perfectly honest. Um, I'll be honest, uh, it used to be for a very long time an American comedian called Louis C.K., but he's um, recently been caught with the, well, he rightfully caught with the Me Too movement. So I no longer listen to him, but if you want to listen to his stuff, except it is quite good. But I would say now my favorite comedian is people like James A. Caster. Uh, I tend to sway a bit more towards British comedy nowadays as opposed to American as I did in the past, because I find that it's a little bit more progressive. British comedian, uh, they're a lot more left-leaning, similar to me. And James A. Caster uh, makes fun of Ricky Gervais for the same reasons I did, which I fully support. And they tend, they, they tend to, they satirize those things that I don't like anyway. Like they would make fun of transphobes, they would make fun of homophobes, they would make fun of racists. So then, and so then it's quite hard for you to get offended by that unless you are a racist, unless you are a homophobe, unless you are a transphobe. Mm -hmm. And also he's quite absurd. I think it takes a while to get used to his type of humor. The first time you watch something from James Acaster, you'll go, what, what on earth did I just watch? But it, um, it grows on you. And then other comedians like John Robbins, and there's a Welsh comedian called Ellis James, uh, who performs bilingually. And if you can find anything from him, he's he's very good. He talks a lot about um, like growing up in a Welsh speaking community in a Welsh speaking world, which I think it needs more of. There's, uh, a, there's a few nods going on there. Uh, yeah, so if you uh, listen uh, maybe to his podcast or, or I think he did a show with Miles Jupp, was it last year? Um, um, because Ellis lives in Welshman in, in England, living in England, and Miles Jupp, an Englishman living in Wales, and, and an interesting dynamic there. We don't have much time left, so the, the final question for the two of you is if, uh, because obviously the, the conversations have only just started, and we could talk about this for another hour or so and, and, and you know, get some feedback as well. Um, Sean touched upon the fact, can we, can we differentiate between the, the person telling the joke and the actual... Uh, art itself the humor itself all of these questions but for now Andrea and Sean um, if there was somewhere uh, for us to to find out more or to read more or to listen more about some of these issues that we've talked about tonight anywhere you direct us I'll go to Sean first because Andrea's still on mute um, well I happened to find this book so I mentioned a British comedian called Stuart Lee and the issues that he had when he wrote Jerry Springer the musical uh, the opera he actually released a book um, how I escaped my certain fate, Stuart Lee. So it's, um, it's an interesting book, not only for learning about how he felt with the whole idea of being um, prosecuted for blasphemy, which for him was an absurd idea. But if you're interested in stand-up as well, he breaks down a lot of his um, uh, stand-up sets and um, like he's got transcripts of them. Transcripts or scripts? And then he talks about why things are funny. If he's saying this is funny because of contents, this is funny because of the way I say it, or this is funny because of timing. So it gives you an appreciation of uh, the art of stand-up as well. I've read it a few times with the hopes of getting a little bit better. Uh, yeah, that's, that's one book I recommend. Or otherwise, watch, watch the movies and shows I recommended. And go see Book of Mormon when you can. It is the best thing I've seen in a while. And if you're a Welsh speaker, Sean's podcast. So, um, yes, Andrew, the, the talk and stuff. I'm, I'm pleased that you gave it and you didn't ask me to. Andrea, I've, I've just got hold of a book. Um, I think it's called Why Is God So Funny? I haven't read it yet, though, so I can't tell you whether it's any good. So as soon as I've read it, I'll let you know. Um, I don't know. I don't know stuff about it. Um, I don't know what there's written on it. Um, I haven't found anything much. Any other passages you'd, you'd say are, are a rip-roaring read in the Bible? Well, I, I genuinely want you, I mean, I think that's what I want I want us all to do. I want you to, you know, when you, each week when you listen to scripture or in your daily prayers or whatever, ask yourself, particularly if, particularly if you read something and you feel amazingly oppressed by it, I, I just want you to ask yourself whether there's a different way of coming at this. Um, and and I, and, I, and I really genuinely want to say, you know, find the picture of the laughing Jesus and stick it on your wall and 
and see how that affects how you see yourself and God. Thanks, Andrew. All right. It's almost time for us to end. A uh, couple of plugs, hopefully, magically appear on your screen. Next month, we will be looking at... Oh, wow, it's big on my screen. How do I get that down? <laughs> Let me see it. All right. uh, we are looking at Exile or Exodus, the Church and the Lost Generation. Um, for this, uh, let's get rid of you there. Uh, for this, we've got a, um, a young Christian podcaster uh who has his own show looking at uh at the faith and and how to uh unpack it he's been on a journey to use that word from quite conservative to quite liberal christianity um so he's uh he's going to be bringing his point of view as well as a urc minister to young adults and we're going to reflect on whether the church as we have it today is a place fit for the young uh so because it's february exactly the same date and time uh, and uh, the link will be the same if you've got the correct one for tonight. So that's about it from us. A huge thanks to, to Bethan for doing some of the publicity, to Claire for facilitating tonight, for everyone for coming along. Um, there's some interesting comments on, on the, uh, the chat, uh, and it was Adam Buxton was the podcast um, that was mentioned. Um, to God for the gift of humour, and of course, hugely, mostly to, to Sean and Andrea for leading our discussions. We are hugely appreciative of your time and uh, all that you've brought to it. As, as people know, we don't pay you anything, uh, I'm afraid, but we do give a donation to uh, uh, the food bank um, on your behalf. Um, so uh, unless you tell me, it will, both will go to, to Ponty Food Bank. But we're hugely grateful. So thanks. And and I know we'll see Andrew again. And I uh, hope in some shape or form we'll see Sean again uh, at church. Maybe a stand-up gig in St. David's when we can open. Or in Castle Square, indeed. Or both. We can have a tour of our churches. A stand-up tour of our churches. Um, for now, to end, uh, the Swiss Reformed theologian, Karl Barth, who was not generally known for his sense of humour, once noted that laughter is the closest thing to the grace of God. So go well and have a gracious and giggly, blessed and blooming hilarious week. And we'll see you next time. Thank you, Phil. Bye, everybody. <laughs>